Courtney DeWalter, welcome back to the podcast. So nice to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. So I publicly insisted you come back on the show in the comment section of your Instagram account. I don't know if you saw that, but the people demanded that you come back on the show. <laughs> you relented after the Grand Raid. So thanks for doing this. How is life a couple of weeks after returning back home to Leadville after the Grand Raid? Yeah, good. Um, I mean, I actually, when I, right before getting on this call, I had to relook at some of the names of the parts of the course, because it feels like at this point it was years ago. I'm like, I can't believe that was only a few weeks back. I, it feels like a lifetime ago at this point. It's funny because my finish still feels like yesterday and that I relive the horror <laughs> of the misery that, that I, uh, the hours I spent on that course. No, I'm just kidding. That It's a spectacular race and I can't wait to talk all about it with you. Um, so obviously, you know, I want to talk all about Diagonal de Fou and the rest of your season. We'll sort of see how far we get with all that stuff, but it's an amazing year. And I figured maybe we just start with kind of a macro view of your season, three big victories, course records, an awesome FKT project. And then of course, like, you know, going back to Barkley doing Zagama. And I wondered, you know, now that your season is over, we could first just reflect on how this season ranks for you, just in terms of like personal fun and enjoyment, personal satisfaction. How does 2022 rack stack up for you? Uh, super cool. I feel really lucky to have gone to some new places, ran with some new people, made memories. Um, yeah. In so many different ways throughout the year. And, uh, I think it was a cool one because there were some projects in there, like Zagama, for example, was really just a bucket list race for me of like one day I have to go try it. And so to get that chance this year to do this iconic, you know, mountain marathon race with insane crowds. You should go to it. You should do it. It is so cool. Um, and like then to do the collegiate loop or, um, to be able to do an ultra with my mom, it was like all these really special experiences along the way mixed in with like a pretty classic race season, I would say. Yeah. So to talk about Zagama a little bit more, I thought that was actually fairly interesting, like a choice for you, just because I think an athlete like you, it'd be really easy just to stick to the things that are in your wheelhouse, you know, usually the longer races. And obviously Zagama is an incredible event. It should be somebody's bucket list race. But I wondered if there's any sort of like consideration you put into it in terms of like stretching yourself, challenging yourself as an athlete, especially competitively, because you're kind of racing against a different different cohort of women and athletes at Zagama than you do at something like the Grand Raid. Yeah, I I knew that it was way out of my wheelhouse, um, but I didn't care that, you know, I was like, maybe I'll get last place there. But just to experience running with this whole different group of people, um, you know, to like soak up as much as I can and maybe pick up, you know, some insights along the way, just by being there with much faster runners. Uh, and then to just get to spend time with people who kind of are in a whole different orbit throughout the race season. Like the people running the long ultras don't usually get to hang out with the golden trail series racers. So mm -hmm. to have all these like pre-race and post-race activities with them was really cool to just, uh, spend that time together. Yeah. Awesome. So what's your process for like coming up with a calendar? Like I imagine things kind of start when you get into hard rock at the end of last year. So what's the process of kind of like filling things in around that? And I'm thinking, especially, the races that you're targeting more, probably like Madeira and the Grand Raid. Can you walk us through that? Absolutely. I uh, got into Hard Rock and um, that was like certain then that I was going to go back and that was going to be a focus of the year after coming off of the previous uh, DNF at Hard Rock. So that was like set in stone once my name was pulled in the lottery. And then um, in the spring, I wanted to pick, you know, a good 
like hard race that would kind of feed into the type of race hard rock is. So find something with a lot of climbing, find something um, that's long enough to be tough, but maybe not necessarily a hundred miles. And then I wanted a fall race and I wasn't sure what that would be, but um, yeah, I had always known about Diagonal Defu and Grand Raid. And then I watched your film about it and uh, talked to like Francois and Camille Bruyas on the Solomon team about it. And it was like, oh, I got to go there. That looks mm -hmm. so cool. So those three were kind of picked as the main targets of the year. And then uh, just filling in fun stuff around them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I just think it's fascinating to sort of think about the strategy that goes into those big decisions, especially somebody like you. And as you mentioned, you and I talked before the Grand Raid. So I think we should, we'll just go into the Grand Raid now because I want to hear all about it. And then we'll kind of go reverse chronologically from there through the rest of your season, if that's okay. But like you mentioned, you and I talked before the race, just so we could like kind of go through the course. I could give you sort of those memories that are still fresh in my mind from the 2021 race. And Which, the experience thank you so I much for all of your wisdom. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> uh, but also like you mentioned, Francois posted an awesome photo of you guys like kind of going over maps or him kind of giving you some of that beta as well. And it made me wonder kind of like, what your process is for kind of like mentally absorbing a, a race like the Grand Raid, especially something that requires such massive travel where you're unfamiliar with the course and terrain, aside from reaching out to people like myself and Francois and Camille who've been there and experienced it. What else do you do to kind of get yourself mentally prepared for that challenge? It's tough uh, if you've never been somewhere to uh make that picture in your head of what it might be like and being able to imagine a place or the trail there can be super helpful. Um, so, you know, I was trying to find photos just to get an idea of like when people say it's technical or when they say it's rocky or they talk about the Mafat, like what are they even talking about? <laughs> just to try and have a little bit of an image. Um, but otherwise I like don't get too caught in the weeds of research or, you know, finding out every detail that might be helpful and figure that, um, a lot of it I'll just figure out during the race. And like, I like that sometimes to come around a corner and it's always a surprise, you know, to not know how long a climb is or to not know, you know, how cool it's going to be when you crest this hill or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I like those surprises. So I try to gather enough information to at least have a hazy picture in my head of it, but then the rest, I just, uh, kind of let go of and let it come. Yeah. It, Cause like, to me thinking about that race in particular, I feel like the week after I could have run the course like two hours faster, just be, for having been there and seen the course. And so I'm just so impressed with the way that you went th there that far and teed it up and walked away with like what I think is one of the best performances of all time. So, but you don't get like too deep in the specifics of things. Like you're not like writing down potential splits to different aid stations and those sorts of like metrics or statistics from past events to sort of measure yourself against? I am not, no. Mm -hmm. And I actually prefer to not know any numbers. Um, but Kevin, the other part of the team, he's a numbers guy. And so he does uh, look at numbers. He makes a spreadsheet for his crewing purposes. And like he tries to estimate where I might be when. Uh -huh. And he then, you know, has dug into previous data. So he has an idea of like how fast or slow sections might be. But for me, I don't, I don't want to know the paces. I don't want to know like. So does he not share those splits with you? Like he makes his own spreadsheet. You're not the one. The spreadsheet doesn't? is for him. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, maybe, maybe we'll talk more about 
Kevin in a bit, but maybe before we go too much further, since the Grand Raid is a race that's less familiar to the American trail running audience, maybe you could just describe your travel to get there and the things that you immediately noticed or just like some takeaways from when you landed on the island, like what the vibe was like. Yeah, I didn't know this island existed before finding out about the race and uh, feel really lucky now to have been there. It's um, very far away from the U.S. Uh, so it's down by Madagascar. You fly from the U.S. to Paris and then from Paris, it's about an 11 hour flight, like straight down almost kind of crossing over Africa to get down to Reunion Island. Um, but it's like this really incredible island. It's um, got like a whole island vibe, like there's palm trees and beaches and surfing, but it's also got this huge range of mountains through the middle of it um, that are like just stunning. They're super jagged and rugged looking, but then they're covered with like just lush greenery everywhere. It's like mountainy, jungly, you know, like pretty crazy. And in that center part of it, which is called the Mafat, which used to be a volcano, apparently that like collapsed inward at some point. Um, there's like little towns throughout it. And the only way people get to those towns is by walking or helicopter. And that just like was blowing my mind yeah. going through those little towns or like looking at them from the edge. You know, I was like, what a life those people are leading in there. Unbelievable. Yeah. And just for the listening audience, Reunion Island has a population of, I think, close to a million people and it's so far away. And that was the thing that surprised me most when I arrived was like, oh my gosh, there's like actually a lot of people here. But they're all sort of concentrated, especially on kind of the northwest coast of the island. And then that middle section, what you call the Mafat, which is just an absolutely out of this world, beautiful place, is pretty much empty with the exception of these incredibly small, sparse, beautiful villages with incredibly hardy people inside. And much of the race traverses that interior of the island, which is harsh. And we'll talk a little bit about that journey for you in a sec. Yeah. And I think another cool part of this island is there are close to a million, but like um, you could talk to anyone there. It, everyone's super friendly and welcoming. And um, you talk to someone in the grocery store or in your hotel and they've heard of the Grand Raid. Oh, yeah. They've heard of Diagonal de Fou likely they've done it or someone they know has done it multiple times, probably like the race is well known and a big deal on the yeah. Island. Yeah. I mean, it's broadcasted on local television for at least 24 hours straight. Yeah. And it's you know, front page news uh, around the Island and you're right. Yeah. All the locals are tuning in and everybody it's the, the local sport, sporting event of the entire year on the island. And that's one of the things that makes it so, so special. How early did you arrive? I'm curious because like, again, I'm just fascinated by how you teed it up so well <laughs> without like knowing so much about the course. Did you arrive fairly early or was it sort of a classic Courtney DeWalter mm -hmm. rush job? <laughs> ambush, an ambush, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, we arrived a week early, yeah, okay. well, a little less than a week. We got there Friday and the race starts Thursday. Mm -hmm. And did oh. you get to check out much of the course? Like, I, I'm just curious, like more about this process question, you know, like in those la those seven days you're there, how do you get yourself ready to be in that position before the grand raid? I didn't fret too much about getting on the course. The island is um, I mean, the course is a hundred miles across it. So to see a lot of the course would involve just like a lot of time in the car and traveling. And, um, so I did see the parts that were near my hotel. I saw, um, the, it's like Chaumaine de Anglais, which yes. is this like <laughs> lava rock thing. Oh uh, Yeah. You advised me to see that beforehand, which yeah. was a very smart move just to be able to visualize that better. Um, 
And otherwise, like I just went with my husband on random trails near us that, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, got us out running and moving and shaking off the airplane, but not necessarily worrying about getting on the course a ton. Yeah. So before we go into the race itself, I'd love to hear more about the kind of your mindset and how your physical feeling was before the race, because like you're coming off hard rock and the collegiate loop to huge races and adventures in themselves. I'm wondering like, and I've talked to a few other people on the podcast about this recently, about kind of like the internal intuition that we develop as athletes about how we might perform at a given race. Like, were you feeling prepared to have like a truly special day on the Island? Uh, no, I've never felt that feeling. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Say more, say more. Uh, I don't know. I think I, um, like we'll prepare as best I can, but like this one, I, you know, I'm in Colorado and I knew a little bit about this race, but I was just like doing my best to prepare for what I thought I would be doing out there. Um, a lot of like hiking without poles, you know, and just like trying to be generally getting more fit and ready for anything then. But, uh, I had no idea. And, um, normally I won't, especially like standing on a start line of these longer ones, I'll never have the feeling of like, I'm fully prepared to knock this one out today because so many things can happen in a hundred miles. And there's always that unexpected wrench that, Mm -hmm. you know, you just couldn't have prepared for. So I think, uh, usually I just am hoping to take each section as it comes and deal with, you know, whatever happens out there as best I can. You must develop a little bit of a sense of like, okay, I'm feeling really good right now. Like when you arrive on the Island and especially sometimes it's reflected in like our attitude and just like how we're feeling about life, whether we're feeling happy and at peace with ourselves. And so I'd love to challenge you on that point a little bit more about like arriving on the Island. Did you, did you like have a sense that you were ready to have a historic type day? No, no, (laughs) but, uh, I felt happy and I felt like super psyched to be there and to get this opportunity to do the race, which I think is huge, you know, like to not feel like I have to do it or to, you know, be dreading the pain that might come with it, but to just be like pumped on like heading a hundred miles across this Island and like struggling and hurting and finding my, my way to that finish line. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's not always like that. Like, so I knew that that was a good sign that I was so excited to be yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. I see. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Um, so talking about the race itself, you know, it starts, I think, what was it? 10 PM on a Thursday evening. So it's already dark. And of course you start with like a seven or 8,000 foot climb up to the highest point on the Island and, uh, or actually not the, not the highest point on the Island, but the high point on the course. I'd love to ask you to talk a little bit about the strategy element of this, because like watching the live tracker the entire duration of the event it was like clear that i mean you're competing for overall positions right and i'd wondered if you have any comments about like how you approach this strategy element especially in a race like this where you've never been there so you don't know how to necessarily moderate your effort i know you're not a spreadsheet person but is there anything that you can tell the audience about sort of what's going through your head in the early parts of the race to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success later on down the trail? I knew, um, that the race got really technical and, um, that the footing would become more difficult and like technical downhills are, um, I don't move very quickly on them. And so my idea or thought was to, um, just, take sections as they came and do them like as best I could. So that first part of the race is really runnable. 
Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, these open fields with a dirt road, you're on some like little town roads quite a bit. And um, so I was just rolling with that, like, you know, pretty efficiently because I knew later on that I would come to some sections where I would have to like pick my way through them a lot more slowly. So it was like taking advantage of the terrain that I could move on, knowing that it wouldn't always be like that. Mm. So do you, in preparation for something like the Grand Raid, if you feel that technical downhilling is your vulnerability, is that something that you consciously worked on at home in Leadville before the race? Uh, <laughs> uh, I need to. Like, if you could give me a lesson, please. <laughs> no, it's that's my weakness too, Gordon. I think everybody needs to be better at technical downhilling. It's like the rare skill. Then when you possess it, it's like a cheat code. Yeah. Yeah. You watch someone go fast on technical downhills and I'm like, do you have ankles? I was just going to say, like, (laughs) uh, just like my experience at the Grand Raid, I've also broken my left ankle and had a grade three sprain on my right ankle. So, you know, I don't run fast on technical distance anymore. (laughs) But like at the start there, when it was super runnable and um, it's just like a steady climb, I found myself near like uh, some people where I was like, oh man, like this is a mistake. Like that person is running smart and I am not running smart right now. Talk about that because like you're mixing it up in the top five men, 50K into the race and you finish in the top five. So it was like clearly proven to be a good strategy or an effective strategy, but I mean, also there must be some elements in your brain of like, this is too fast. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 uh, I even said it to one of them. I was like, I shouldn't be by you right now. Like you're, you have a plan probably. And I do not, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, it was, then I just reminded myself, like, we're taking the sections, get like, take what the course gives you basically. And so it was giving me, you know, this super sweet runnable stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had to just take advantage of that while it was there. Yeah. So then going into the Mafat, I'd love for you to maybe describe this a little bit more. One of the challenges of the Grand Raid is that in this section, it's also very difficult to receive crew support. So can you tell us about the strategy you guys employed through the Mafat? We were super lucky. Uh, There's a whole Solomon team on the island and Francois had been intending to run, but ended up not. So his whole, you know, crew of people were there. So we actually had like so many hands on deck who were willing to hike into places or help us out. Um, but yeah, you drop into the Mafat and you go through these little towns and they have wonderful aid stations set up. Like those were bigger than I pictured they would be like, mm-hmm. they're huge productions yep. in there. If, Cause they drop everything in via helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> Operation, uh, aid station drop. Yeah. But <laughs> the, I did have a couple of those where I had people who we had given them, you know, my tailwind and some food and uh, just some really basic things. So they were there with them ready. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, really slick, but uh, dropping into the, into the Mafat is, is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane in there. And so then, well, before we get to that, I'd love to also hear about the conversations that you had with Francois before the race, because obviously he's a four-time champion. He's one of the greatest of all time. You guys are friends and teammates. And uh, I think the audience would love to hear maybe some of the advice he bestowed upon you as somebody who's also been successful on the course. He was so kind, uh, walked me through, you know, the map and um, some like big climbs or things to think about some areas where, you know, I should be aware it's going to be hot, stuff like that. And then basically his message was like, you know, just be chill and keep moving and keep eating and hydrating, like be aware of your temperature because Mm -hmm. it gets really cold at night, gets really hot in the day and to take care of those little details so that they don't become big problems. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he 
you know, gave Kevin some great crewing information and he volunteered to be at two of the crew spots so that uh, Kevin could be at some other ones. And so mm. uh, Francois crewed me at Salouse, which is like a cool. Pretty, yeah, yeah. That's a sort of like the transition theater. between night and day for the listening audience. A yeah. really important aid station. Yeah. For yeah. Them. Yeah. Super important. And then the next one too, which is um, just that one hour climb away yep. before you head actually into the Mofat. So yeah. he crewed me at both those places and was, you know, as expected, like such a good crew and yeah. like just cranked me through and got me out of there while telling a joke, which was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what a duo. Come on. Friends, it was so Oz, fun. Crew and Courtney at the Grand <laughs> Raid. That's not fair. It all makes sense now. It all makes sense. So coming, coming out of the Mafat, moving further down the course, one of the things that I recall from talking to Fabrice Payette, aka Daff, who's sort of like the unofficial ambassador for the event, and that's captured in our movie about the Grand Raid, is him saying, you know, once you're out of the Mafat, you think it's over, but it's never over. <laughs> it's <laughs> never over. It is legitimately never over. <laughs> and like you, you're continuing to kind of build momentum and retain your position in the overall top five the entire way, it never kind of losing ground on the guys in front of you. I'm wondering sort of like how you're processing that stuff psychologically as well. Like probably thinking early in the race, as you mentioned, uh, this is maybe a little bit too aggressive. This might lead to future disaster, but that disaster clearly never came. As you moved out of the Mafat, were you pretty confident that you were having a special day or is this still a situation where you have none of that intuition? No, I, um, I had some really low moments in the Mafat, like, um, climbing to Roche Plot, which is what, like 70 miles. I had a lower moment at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, like dragged my feet into Roche Plot. I had some crew meeting me there and they were incredible, but I was like, are there houses for sale here? Because there is no way I can ever get myself out of the Mafat. Like yeah. Yeah. I was like, I'm just going to live here. Someone tell Kevin to meet me in Roche Plot. We're living here for the rest of our lives mm -hmm. because I was so smoked like that climb up to Roche Plot and just like the heat, which wasn't even that extreme this year, the humidity, like the relentless footing and technical terrain that you just always have to be thinking of. I, yeah, I was like a like drowned rat when I got to Roche Plot and um, chugged like two liters of Coke and uh, ha saw Katie Scheid. She was there crewing. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I am wrecked. And she was like, everyone's wrecked. You're doing great. I was like, <laughs> okay, good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um out of there then I started to like get a little more bounce back in my step but mm -hmm. there had been a couple pretty uh tough hours going through the Mafat. I was going to ask you about that because like as a spectator who wasn't like watching any live stream but just kind of watching the splits all day it felt to me like this was a really special day like an absolutely flawless magical execution. So it sounds like that was not the case. Uh, I mean, it just had the normal speed bumps along yeah. it, you know, like a hundred miles does. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had it linked up with, I was near, um, German and Ben for, you know, tons of hours. And so we were kind of yo-yoing and just having them around was like, uh, I don't know. It was like really good, positive energy moving forward and we could, you know, hoop and holler at each other and like pass the good vibes to each other, you know, when we were having good moments and someone else was struggling. So that was really cool to do so many hours with them. Amazing. So then fast forward to the finish line here so we can get to some other stuff as well. I love talking about this with you, but it was such an amazing performance. What did it feel like to break the tape under 27 hours, 26, 44? I mean, 
or what was it? No, 20, it was 24 hours, wasn't it? Hold on. I'll pull it up here. I've got it going, but either way, it was like a two hour new course record. It was two and a half hours faster than I ran the course. How did you feel at the finish line? So excited to be there and <laughs> uh, so tired. Um, just needing a beer and a chair, like immediately the, I mean, even the last three miles of that course are like, yeah, just it's nonstop. Like you're doing this downhill. So you would think, you know, Oh, sweet. Just cruise three last miles downhill to the finish, but it's like just really technical and tough. So you get like what, uh, maybe 400 meters of just flat running into the finish line. And then, you know, you made it, but before that, the whole time is like all hands on deck, just trying to make it down in one piece. Yeah, that I felt like was the real challenge of the course and of the race is that it's just you have to be mentally engaged, kind of looking at your feet the entire way. Yeah, that, that really wears you down. And I wonder if it's something you could train. But anyway, an awesome performance. I wondered, like to put you on the spot, maybe a little bit how you maybe view this in the greater context of your career. And like as because to me, it feels like one of the greatest performances ever. And uh you know, obviously you've done a lot of awesome things in, in your career. Like, how does this one feel to you just in terms of your overall performance and how you, you know, enjoyed or, you know, how satisfied are you um, with this race as compared to maybe some other ones? It felt really satisfying to get to the finish line of this one because it had been so hard. Like I was in the pain cave for well over half of the race, just like trying to keep moving forward. And that makes it, you know, so exciting then to make it to the finish and, um, to have had this whole team of people helping and then there to, uh, celebrate and drink a beer with made it, uh, yeah, it was cool. It was, and it was like such a great community along the entire trail. There were people cheering everywhere. Yeah. So, but like, if you look at it against UTMB from two years ago, was UTMB, did it feel easier? Like, did you have fewer low points? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This one was way more, uh, just, just struggling. <laughs> Well, congratulations, Courtney, such an awesome race and so cool to see, you know, throughout the day. And then the things that you guys were posting on Instagram afterwards, it was just like, wow, it seemed like a really special trip for you and an awesome way to end the season. I also had pulled off another stat that I saw online and I doubt you've seen this or care about it, but just for the listening audience that you and Killian are now the only people to win Western States, Hard Rock, UTMB, and the Grand Raid in history. That's a quadfecta for the ages. So <laughs> congratulations on putting that together. So Thank I was promised, you. I want to talk about some other things that you did this year and just sort of backing up one step. One of the most special things that you did this year, at least in my opinion, was running an ultra with your mom. And so I would love to hear you talk about your mom, what influence she's had on you as a person, as an athlete and what that experience was like. It was so cool. It was, yeah, a highlight of my life for sure. Um, and we, uh, went to an ultra in Minnesota, a 50 mile race there on the superior hiking trail, which made it extra special just to be back in my home state had my dad and Kevin out there crewing. And uh, my mom is amazing. She is so tough and so positive. And uh, she was so psyched to do this. She had never done a trail ultra. She, um, yeah, I don't know. It was just like, it was so cool to basically get to see it all through fresh eyes again you know, after being in the sport for 10 years, like I didn't forget how cool it was, but just to, you know, get that like lens back on it front and center of like everything being brand new. And, you know, she didn't have any idea what an aid station might look like out there in the middle of the woods or like <laughs> did she technical train? trails. Like she was did she training train. for this? Yeah, she did train. Um, 
she was, I sent her poles in a pack. So she was, you know, doing laps on the local ski hill, trying to learn how to do the uphills and the downhills. But the trail there is just like relentlessly technical and like all these tiny hills that, you know, death by a thousand cuts or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't quite prepared for the footing and Mm -hmm. like how that beats you up over the hours of doing it. Yeah. So immediately afterwards, though, she was like, that was the coolest thing. Like, we have to try again. We have to, you know, do this again, because now I know, you know, what I could do better, which I think all of us can relate to, like, you know, doing something and then realizing all the lessons that you can take for the next one. So that was cool. Watch out. Watch out master's division. (laughs) We will be back on the start line next year. (laughs) And I I love that she was rocking your trademark long shorts too. It seemed like you guys just had an absolute ball. Knowing It's a a chicken or the egg thing because she's always worn long shorts, but so have I. So (laughs) that's the influence. Yeah. I'd love to hear also like knowing that you've been a lifelong athlete and knowing that like, you know, you were a really good Nordic skier growing up and then a runner, obviously like how your mom has maybe supported you through that journey now in your sort of mid thirties and still out there crushing it as a trail runner, which I'm sure neither of you would have ever imagined when you were a little girl. She, uh, yeah, both my parents were always so supportive of any, any sport we wanted to try. Um, but my mom would always then try it with me. So like when I joined the cross country ski team and was just like, falling every 10 feet, you know, trying to learn how to cross country ski. She got an old pair of cross country skis as well. And like, would we'd walk down to the soccer field and try and cross country ski together. Like we were like, we can figure this out. Like, let's do it. We've got to, you know, stay on our feet somehow. Mm -hmm. So she's always been down for that, like always up to like learn something new with me or, uh, try a new sport. She's always been really active and, uh, like a huge supporter of everything. What an awesome thing. What an awesome thing. So then backing up another step again, we're going reverse chronological (laughs) or another thing uh, that you did this summer shortly after hard rock was the collegiate loop. And this I had never heard of prior to you posting about it, but it looks like an absolutely spectacular route there near your home in, Western Colorado. So maybe first just introduce the audience to what the collegiate loop is. Basically the Colorado trail goes from Durango to Denver, 500 miles. And through the center portion of it, the Colorado trail kind of splits around the collegiate mountain range and you can go on the West side of it or on the original Colorado trail that was made on the East side of that mountain range. And so this collegiate loop uh, just does that particular loop around those peaks, the west side and the east side, um, equaling like 160-ish miles, a lot of it above 11,000 feet, um, and just like in the stunning terrain of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And when you posted about it, you said something like I'm craving a multi-day adventure or something like that, which made it feel like it was sort of a spontaneous decision post hard rock. So going back to kind of the conversation at the beginning of like setting goals and things for yourself, was it spontaneous and how did it fit into the greater mosaic of your competitive season? It was, um, a little spontaneous, but also like always kind of, uh, the embers were always there, just ready to be lit. Um, basically, when I made the season, I decided to leave August and September pretty open with the thought that if I felt good after Hard Rock and if the weather worked out and if you know all these variables were mm-hmm. pointing in the green light direction, then I could go after a project. So I wasn't sure exactly which one I wanted to do, but the collegiate loop was on that list of like, this is a route I definitely want to try to put together 
with my feet. Um, and so the recovery after hard rock went well, training in August was, you know, back on. And then there was a weather window and we were like, sweet, we can just throw stuff in the trunk and drive down the street and start this. Like, let's do it. Why not? Mm -hmm. Incredible. And one of the things that you said afterwards that I think is really cool that I'd love for you to expand on was that one of the things that made it special was that you had the men's FKT holder, Nick Petitella on your crew and that Annie Hughes, the women's FKT holder had come out to surprise you on the course. Can you say more about that? It's uh, just like the perfect example of how cool this sport is. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Nick and I know each other and have done some different adventures together. And um, yeah, he basically, when we decided we were going to go for it, the weather looked good. We sent out an email to a, a small group of people to be like, is anyone, you know, ready for an adventure? Can you come join us uh, and crew and pace a little bit? And I mean, he, he instantly was like, absolutely, I'll be there, you know, and that's just so cool. Like good to have friends like that, isn't it? What a good, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm going to go run for like 45 hours. Could you, could you come hang out? Anyone free? <laughs> Yeah, the yes to adventure people are the people that you want. Um, so that was great. He was like, he paced me a ton. He was crewing along with Paul and Meredith Terranova and Kevin. Uh, and then, so I did the West Side first, which is pretty inaccessible, like hard to get to, a little more of a pain to crew. And then you, I came back on the East Side which is closer to towns, easier to drive into. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, just like random friends were showing up in places like Gina Lucrezi from Trail Sisters, you know, was like, I've been following your tracker. Just wanted to like run a mile with you. So cool. Yeah. And then A&E and some friends showed up. It was like, yeah, I don't know. Just such a good example of like how special this community is and uh, that it's not about the FKT, actually. It's more about like just seeing how we can elevate each other. Love it. I was looking at the route just on GPX and on fastestknowntime.com and it strikes so me. So that you can do it. Yeah, right. I've never woken up thinking, I, I'm I need a multi-day <laughs> adventure right now. <laughs> but uh, I certainly admire people who do. So shout out to you. <laughs> But, um, Wait, are you a are you a yes to adventure guy? I, am. I will come crew you when you do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be hanging with the Terranovas and Nick Petitella, probably smashing some white claws and <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> but um, it seems like this is an underrated loop, you know, especially because it's like in the same neighborhood as the Nolan's 14. Like, does is the collegiate loop up there with like one of the all time classics, in your opinion? It should be. It's super underrated. Nick and I were actually talking about that on one of the sections he was pacing me on. And it was like, it would be so awesome to see more people come out and experience this loop because it is really wild. And like, you're back in the mountains, like tucked on this tiny little single track with huge landscapes all around you. And, um, the loop makes sense, you know? So it yeah. feels like this very, like, logical thing to do and it's a fun distance like it's not going to take a week it doesn't take like planning for five days necessarily you can uh you know play with the sleep game a little yeah. bit and like that's a fun variable so it's it's almost like a little bit between doing something like nolan's or the you know, Wonderland Trail and doing something like the full Colorado Trail, you mean? It's like kind of that in-between distance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So jumping back in the time machine again and reversing another month or so, let's spend the rest of our time just talking about Hard Rock because, of course, you know, we all have recency bias or short attention and memory spans at this <laughs> point. And Dagonle de Fu was uh, such a spectacular performance that people may forget that just a couple months before you were back at Hard Rock. And of course, 
in 2021, you had an unfortunate DNF and a disappointment there. And since then, you've had a pretty awesome run. And when last time you were on the podcast, you talked about some of the adjustment adjustments that you had made and your kind of like nutrition and things like that. And I wondered before we kind of talk about the race itself, if you would maybe reflect a little bit more now with a bit more perspective on some of the adjustments that you made after last year's hard rock and maybe how they've impacted what seems to have been an awesome past 18 months for you. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight now, I'm very thankful for hard rock working out like it did Mm -hmm. um, because it did teach those lessons. But um, I think I have uh, a new, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like a new respect for the tiny details Mm -hmm. again. I, I know they're important, but I think you can easily slip into comfort and like, you know, leave those tiny things to the side thinking that they're all good and you don't have to pay attention to them anymore. Um, but just being reminded again, that like the little things need just as much work as the big things and to always keep it rotating where, you know, you give everything your attention as you can. So for me, it was things like nutrition and um, like a reminder of the troubleshooting that is possible and like how to handle nutrition when it's going poorly during a race. And that has been really helpful in this last like year of racing and projects. Anything on the strategy side of the event, aside from, you know, those, those small details, obviously, like, I know you really just wanted to close the loop again, or close the loop for the first time at hard rock. Was that kind of in the back of your head too, of just like maybe approaching the race with a bit more, just like caution. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if I would use the word caution, mm-hmm. but I, I would um, say approaching races with like um, an understanding that if it, if stuff hits the fan, you know, everything goes wrong. There are so many things you can do mm-hmm. to actively try to keep moving forward. And uh, there's, you know, so many examples of that all around us all the time. Like, uh, yeah, I think just remembering that problems can be solved and sometimes time solves problems the best. And I think like the time piece I had forgotten, you know, Mm -hmm. I was like spiraling and, uh, forgot to do some very basic problem solving. Well, Tell us about the race itself. Cause it seemed like it was a, again, a pretty special day. I know you don't have an intuition going into the race, so I won't ask about that, but would love any anecdotes you can share from the day itself. It seemed like, again, you were sort of in control of the women's race from the beginning, sort of competing for overall positions for sure. And, uh, yeah, I've like put together a course record performance, you know, sort of matching Diana Finkel and then exceeding it at the end, every step of the way, any, uh, any fun stories or anecdotes from the hard rock race? Oh gosh. Um, let me try to even remember the, yeah. <laughs> it was super cool. Um, I mean, one special part was I picked up a pacer in your my buddy, Mike Ambrose, and he paced me 50 miles all the way to Cunningham. Mm -hmm. He did the hard rock 50, which is is no small task for a pacer. Um, so we spent a lot to adventure, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. He's a yes to adventure guy for sure. Um, and like that one, we, I had stomach issues again. Um, but we just kept having to pump the brakes and try to like keep in any nutrition I could, because every time I was trying to push during the second half of that race, I was throwing up. Um, so it was like this whole game of like, where's the finding the line of how much effort I could be putting in. 
to not throw up so that we could keep in at least a little bit of fuel. But it was fun to play that game with a buddy out there in the middle of the Colorado mountains. What an awesome run. So maybe asking a similar question to what I asked about Francois before, of course, the men's race this year at Hard Rock was fascinating and so exciting between Killian and Francois and Dakota and Danny Jung and Browning further down the list, but especially guys like Killian and Francois and Dakota off the front and really like racing on the hard rock course. I wondered if after the race, if you'd all sort of commiserated and reflected on uh, the hard rock journey and if there was any fun anecdotes from the conversations with those great champions that you could share, I'm sure the audience would love it. Yeah, man, they were in, uh, yeah, their own league for sure. I wasn't anywhere near them or having anything similar, um, of an experience. I could see Jeff Browning's headlamp for a little bit before he, you know, made it much larger gap on me. Um, yeah, I, it was kind of like a solo quest out there with my pacer. I, uh, was in a pretty no man's land area of the race and, um, that was cool too, in its own way. But like after the race, did you talk to Killian and Francois and like, did you guys exchange some war stories about the experience out there? Not really. No. I mean, we talked, yeah. but not about running. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were like, we did plenty of running. So yeah. now let's talk about something else. Cool. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. So moving towards the finish line here. Courtney, thanks for spending so much time. I'd love to take a wider view of kind of your career right now. And I know you've spoken about wanting to take advantage of this moment in your life and be present with it. And that's fantastic. But I wondered, you know, I don't think you're ever going to need to go back to being a teacher again. And I wondered like if you had any thoughts about the future for you of, you know, like post athlete life, because you and I are the same age and eventually, you know, this amazing journey is going to come to a close, even if we are living in the moment and enjoying every moment of it. I wonder if you have thought at all about what comes after professional athlete life. Ah, uh, I mean, you're clearly executing on all of that much better. <laughs> Right now. No, I'm not. Got, no, I'm you, not. You have a lot of non-running things that you're um you've got going, which yeah, is but now I don't have running things. It's a problem. <laughs> this is the problem, Courtney. Um yeah, I mean, part of it is like uh I never knew this chapter existed or that I would arrive at it, you know. So then predicting the next chapter is kind of like, ooh, yeah. do I even want to? try and predict it or should we just see what happens when we turn the page? Um, and the other part is like, I love this sport so much and I, um, want more people to experience it and to get to be part of it. And so thinking about, you know, like how I can play a role in growing the sport and, um, making people feel like it's something they want to try. So, mm. I think that could look a lot of different ways. And like, I don't necessarily have like any balls moving forward, but like just some balls that I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. like what they could do. Awesome, man. I think you could be so effective in that capacity and you already are. <laughs> so uh, we'll look forward to seeing what chapter is next, but I have a feeling that this chapter is far, far from over. So <laughs> I didn't want to imply that. Obviously, you're coming off an absolutely fantastic season and the future is still very, very bright. Wrapping up now, speaking of the future, there's been some people who've been dropping screen caps on social media of your name on the Bandera 100K list. So, of course, <laughs> I got to ask. There's a lot of eyeball emojis there looking at that. I know your, your 2022 season is over, but tell us about 2023 and if you will indeed be going to San Antonio, Texas to battle it out. Yeah. Yeah. I am signed up for Bandera. Um, I thought, you know, that one would just fly under the radar for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a ultra sign up, you know, I was like, right. you got to <laughs> dig to find this start yes. list. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and I hear they give out golden tickets there. So I will be seeing if I can uh, find some speed yeah. for a hundred K of running uh, mm-hmm. to get a ticket. Amazing. Cool. Well, that's only a couple months away now. So we'll all <laughs> look forward to seeing what happens there, but I know it's been a long season for you and I'm sure you're ready for a nice little break here now. So congratulations on everything you've accomplished, Courtney. You're such a great champion. It's so fun to watch your career and it's amazing to have the opportunity to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for everything you're doing.